get underway. Whakatakata te hau ki te uru, whakatakata te hau ki te tonga, ki mā kina kina ki uta, ki mā taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. And for those of you, I love knowing the translation, so I'd like to just read to you what it translates to because it's lovely. Cease the winds from the west, Cease the winds from the south, let the breeze blow over the land, let the breeze blow over the ocean. Let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day and a glorious session in this instance. Duane, I would like to um, hand over to you and let you do an acknowledgement of country and then we shall kick off. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'd just like to acknowledge all, all First Nations people and countries that we're all uh, sitting on. Um, where I am in Perth here, um, I'm in what they call Wajuk country, which is part of the Noongar Nation. Um, nation, there's 14 clan groups or um, part of the Noongar Nation, so I'd like to acknowledge all First Nation people um, right across um, where where we're holding this, this meeting. Um, and to acknowledge um, Elders past and present and also emerging. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, it's my great privilege to join you from um, Wanaka in uh, the South Island of New Zealand to Wai Punamu, which for those of you who don't know what that translates to, it's the land of the greenstone. Punamu is greenstone, as I think many of you know. Uh, and I've got glorious Southern Alps with beautiful sunshine out my window today. Um, I, um, just a couple of brief, brief housekeeping matters on that point around where you're joining us from. Um, if you have a moment, we would encourage you to use the chat function and just say um, uh, kia ora and hello. Um, and if you uh, so choose, you can um, pop where you're dialing in from. It's always nice to know the geographic uh, regions. And also, if you happen to know the country from um, that that you're in, uh, to include that as well in your um, in your own acknowledgement. We will crack on swiftly. Uh, the only other two key things I want to let you know is if you have any issues, um, try using your uh, the chat function to privately message Sunita or Marie. Sunita is AES New Zealand um, and Marie is Manus. Um, though I can wave to you. Um, and if you get really stuck, then um, you can email Michelle, but um, uh, that would be a last resort. Um, we are going to, um, in terms of the session, we've got the panel and they're going to each speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, what we're going to ask is that you hold your questions, either note any questions that you have down on a piece of paper and then ask you to start popping your questions into the chat once the three speakers have spoken. It just means that um, your questions don't get lost um, further back in the chat function. So, um, and the other final thing is we've got the slides being driven centrally, so there'll just be the odd delay sometimes as they're advanced through on behalf of our speakers, um, given we've got three that we felt that was going to work best. So I'm going to shush up now and I'm going to hand over. Our first speaker is, um, is Doyen Radcliffe from Community First Development um, and very much looking forward to your, your presentation, Doyen. Okay, thank you. Uh... Cara. Um, yeah, uh, just to let everybody know who I am, I'm, I'm a uh, Yamaji Nagaja Wadri man. I'm, my country is about uh, 350 kilometres north of Perth. Um, the Yamaji country is a ger generic name uh, for a collective group of people, and there's about 16 language groups involved in the Yamaji Nation and Nugja is who I am and the other side is Wadri which is um, 
another language group. So I'm part of two groups up in the Yamaji country. Um, okay. Um, I'm also a director with the AES, current director and former vice president, and currently I'm the regional manager with the Community First Development. Um, we just undertaken a brand name, um, a change of name. We were formerly known as Indigenous Community Volunteers. Um, so, and we work predominantly do a lot of uh, work with um, First Nations community nationally. Um, basically, I look after all the WA, um, working with uh, communities both urban, regional, and very remote. Okay, if you slip through that second slide. So we're a national, um, community development organisation, research organisation, so we promote skills and talents and could, um, culture strength of our people and facilitate community activities that lead to positive change um, um, for their communities um, nationally. Um, I click on the next slide. Um, how we work, we provide um, practical support and we have a network of school volunteers that we match up with communities. Um, all the work that we do with communities is 100% community driven. So we don't go on with our agenda. Everything is we do, we work towards the community's vision. And we only go in there by invitation. Um, we don't do things for the community, we actually, work alongside communities. Um, and every project that we do, we monitor and evaluate um, as well to prove that we have an impact. Um, get you to move to the next slide. This is our, this is our community development. Um, sorry, let's go back. This is our community development framework and this is basically how we work in the field with, with communities. So basically our approach involves working by invitation, which I mentioned earlier. We also, and when we sit down with communities, we do some active listening and deep listening and we share our learnings as, as we work on with communities um, on activities. Um, we spend a lot of time in understanding the community's challenge and vision. Um, so when we when we work with communities, we actually don't just breeze in and breeze out. We take time to um, understand the circumstance of the community, all the backgrounds, all the issues, and we tend to work on average about five years with communities. So um, we've worked on communities with communities for longer. Uh, up to seven years at some stage. So we believe that's the best approach and we build on local strength, knowledge and resources. And we also, we, we match uh, skilled volunteers to the activities co-designed and directed by the communities. So and we acknowledge that we work at the community's pace. We don't go in and just force an agenda and the pace that the community can't keep up with. So we work at the community's pace. Um, embedded in, in our project work and community development activity is our monitoring evaluation. So everything is um, embedded in, in, into our everyday work. I'll get you to slip across the next slide. Um, yeah, so basically when we work with communities, we, um, like I said, we sit down and listen and work at work, work with the communities to understand their vision and working towards our vision. And we plan things together and match the volunteers, you know, sometimes 
what seems impossible is always possible because we're always salute, very solution focused about what we do and, and, and our approach. As you can see there, this is this is feedback from a community um, uh, that I've worked in the past with that Pinjara. Uh, some of the feedback that's come back. Uh, if we slip along to the next slide. As with the COVID-19 that come up, it, it kind of threw us in a bit of disarray. It kind of didn't and didn't, didn't. but the community resilience um, shone through. Um, and yeah, we, we anticipated that work, things would slow down, but it actually never, um, if you slip along to the next slide. Um, as with the COVID-19, you know, with First Nations people at particular risk from um, infection, so it left many of our communities um, isolated and vulnerable. So we we're quick, we we're a pretty agile organisation, so we took swift actions um, when the restrictions were put, put in place. Um, to keep the community safe, yet we still remain connected to those cr crucial uh, um, projects. Um, and the communities responded just as quickly. Um, together we come up um, innovative and different ways to keep projects moving forward. Um, obviously with with the innovation, there's nothing more powerful than face-to-face -face meetings. Um, what slide are we on? Sorry. On the innovation slide, Dwayne. Okay. Um, so normally we have face-to-face -face meetings. That's generally how we operate. But um, with the COVID-19, present an opportunity to have a yarn with the community through video conferencing, uh, interactive whiteboard sessions, screen sharing. And we and we got on with our job to keep on progressing critical um, community projects. As that um, in April alone, with the harshest shutdown here in, the, in, the, in Australia, we, there was still were able to keep 57 active community first. Uh, development projects going across the country with different communities in remote urban and regional settings. Um, I'll get you to click on to the next one. Um, you know, with the Sorry. Um, so this is one one of the examples where where we were able to keep on working. This is um, Jimmy working with Andy on a act on a project to support digital literacy work planning. Um, and we were still mate, even though we we're working on online, the face to face meeting, we we're still able to maintain the that relationship, even though we. Um, we're working online and the critical part of our work is keeping that relationships going within the communities we work um, to keep activities going that's very important and and to prog progress things um, and with a lot of some of our communities they had less experience in using online platform whereas some uh, some of the communities were very experienced I might get you to click along the next slide. This is a particular project I've been working on. Um, um, this is with the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre. Um, as you can see, I've got uh, myself there with, with the beanie on working with engineers, um, Devon Kumar, the CEO of the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre and Architects and Engineering. 
in putting together a plan about building a healing center in in the um, in Newman of WA in the Pilbara. Um, so we will still like we're very familiar with using uh, online platforms. But if I get you to click on the next. Um, some of the communities that we work with had had um, less experience, so it meant meant building the capacity of the community to use video conferencing um, prior to doing um, evaluation interviews of CD activities. And once the communities were comfortable with technology, they were able to progress um, the CD activities and do evaluation. Um, it, it took a bit of investment of our own time to to do this work, but once the communities got on board and learned how to use um, online platform, it, come, it came a lot easier in doing our community development activities and our monitoring and evaluation, as you can see. Um, with this particular project here um, in y y Yandamu in uh, Northern Territory, as you can see. Um, people come very comp confident and um, yeah, uh, we got things moving. I'll get you to click on to the next slide. Um, now, sorry about this. That's another thing that we've done was um, we, as part of um, we we done um, we developed uh, a yarning tool in response to our learning from um, the first two stages from our action learning um, action research project and. The round one interviews used more formal, semi-structured interview um, interview approach, um, and it kind of felt a bit foreign using that approach. So we come up with this yarning tool. Um, we find that yarning was was the best way of communicating with communities, um, and particularly online, um, where we used to meet face to face, that wasn't applicable. So um, yarn and become uh, come away um, as the most effective tool that we use to talk deeply with First Nations people about um, this particular project, which is um, um, understanding government practices in first First Nations community. Um, and as you can see there, you'll see one of the tools that we use there, you'll see the seed to tree approach is the approach that we currently use as part of, and we adapted it also into our project work um, to gauge where a community was up. It could be developing a strategic plan, a business plan, it gave us an indication where the community was um, in trying to catch us some data and information. Um, I'll get you to click across to the other page. Um, and as part part of that, um, as part of that to um, the the first round of interviews that come out with there was we checked in with emerging themes that come from the first report with communities and but it was more it, it was more challenging to do um, the the online instead of face to face but it worked um, um, coding analysis. Um, I suppose out of this action research stuff, 
that we were doing, uh, work that we're doing. Um, over the last three months, our community development team have been applying our knowledge game through our community of practice sessions. So we're always doing reflective learning processes um, and doing activities um, which is really embedded in our workflow. Um, the M&E doesn't set outside, it's actually embedded right into our workflow. So we're, uh, we're learning, we've got a learning culture within, within community first development. Um, and we do a community of practice sessions to analyze um, our work. And part of that was to uh, code the code the action research project um, into themes and we have done it collaboratively as a team but also within smaller regional teams working groups um, through specifically uh, prepared data um, if you click onto the next screen um, with the little world working group interviews one of the processes we we done with this l learning um, is use a virtual whiteboard um, where we're able to organise the themes into collective groups and and colour code them and put them into code all the themes as part of the research into groups and then we further going to analyse that information. Um, we found the interactive whiteboard was very good for us, um, particularly given that we're a national organisation and we have different people from different areas. And have an ability, and uh, we used Miro in this, in this case and we were able to shift these sticky notes around and put it and clump them into groups um, and then analyse um, the key themes that have come out of this research project. Um, it's on the next, I think that's about it. Yeah, basically for community first development, it was a learning kit curve. I, I suppose we were able to act very quickly. We're quite agile. Um, and also use our existing relationships with the communities that we're working with to get in there and start building capacity of communities to start using online flat, uh, platforms to continue our community development work, but also to monitor and evaluate um, the activities that we're doing on the ground. Um, we're always learning with just because we just develop one way of doing something, we're always learning and we're prepared to try new things um, and in different circumstances um, to keep projects happening and going on the ground. Um, I, I hope I made myself um, clear, but if there's any questions at the end, I'm prepared to answer them. Thank you very much, Joy, and that was really great. Um, and I hope you all saw our, we had the, there was just a little technical glitch with that slide set, which is why we could only show it to you that way. John Farger is going to be up next. Um, and uh, he's gonna be sharing his experience um, at uh, working remotely with some of his international development work in Indonesia. I'll give Sunita a couple of moments to um, find the slides and pull them up. Thanks to those of you who've um, sent messages through. Um, do get in touch if you've got any questions or issues. Um, and just double checking, um, I, Doi, and I haven't had a chance to ask you, but the others are happy uh, for us to share slides. So we'll get those organized as well. Yep. Okay. And, um, so need it. There we go. Perfect. All right. I'll put myself on mute and invite John to step up to the plate. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome. And thank you, Doyen, for an interesting uh, kickoff, some interesting tools and methods there. Um, my name is John Farga. I'm an evaluator who's been working internationally for 40 odd years. Um, and I've worked in 
war zones, natural disaster areas during the immediate aftermath of natural disasters and in post-conflict zones doing evaluations on the ground. And I've also recently started doing some remote evaluations. And I think when things are not very good, remote is better than actually being there, particularly in war zones. So it, it's been a learning curve, like uh, Doyen said, but I think we've learned a lot. So if we go to the first slide, please, um, Anita. Or the, the, the first one with anything on it. So this is in Eastern Indonesia. It's a project, if you click one more time, please, Anita. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a very large Australian World Bank financed agribusiness program in the six provinces to the east of Indonesia. So it's a very big area, um, including uh, central and east Java, which are quite middle income, right through to Papua, which is very poor and um, in many ways has similarities to parts of remote um, Aboriginal Australia and Torres Island, Island of Australia. Um, and in fact, down in the, the, the southeast of um, Papua, it, it is Australian. They, they have kangaroos and cockatoos and melaleucas and eucalypts and it smells and sounds like Australia, but, but people speak Papuan and, and Bahasa Indonesia. Um, we're working with a lot of private sector business partners in this program and it's into a second phase um, after a first phase of four years, we're 18 months into that second phase. And one of the ways they assess progress in this pr program is to have a six monthly independent formative evaluation. So it's a learning evaluation. And there's just two of us who implemented, Rob Hitchens and me. And so we've been doing this for um, nearly six years now, and we know the people and we've got existing relationships. We know the country in the different locations. We know many of the interventions. So that, that helps with doing things remotely. But um, normally we would have 14 days, once every six months, to do field work, do interviews, um, document review, the, the fairly standard sort of um, performance and quality, uh, progress quality uh, evaluation. But going forward, if we go to the next slide, please, Anita, there's a number of opportunities in working remotely, some challenges, and I'll tell you our approach. So just to start with, the opportunities, because we have existing relationships and time series data, it was much easier for us with document review and some targeted um, interviews and questions to update information and get a sense of progress and quality. It would have been very difficult if we'd never worked with these people before and it was a, a, a sort of Greenfields evaluation. Because we did less field work, there was a lot less distraction for the implementation team. And we, we used that saving um, to create an opportunity to deep dive into selected themes. Um, because you have more analytical time when you're not planning field trips and bouncing around in uh, land cruisers in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we were much more focused in our discussions. Because we know each other when we get together, there's always banter and how the family's going and what's happened, this and that. And um, I mean, that's part of being human and so it's important, but we were very much more efficient remotely than when we were together. Um, so some of the challenges, if you go to the next one, please, Anita. Just click it one more time. That's it, thank you. Um, the decision to conduct this most recent evaluation in, in March remotely was made three days before our planned start. So I, I was actually in, in an airport on the way to Jakarta and Surabaya when the decision was made. So this was remote and um, you know, a, a shock to the logistics it required a lot of 
change, the, the purpose of the evaluation was exactly the same. That did not change, but clearly the schedule and the approach did change. Um, there was a challenge with less informal reflection and behind the scenes talk. As, as you all know, when you're conducting an evaluation, there's formal processes, including the sorts of processes and tools that Doyen talked about, you know, yarning tools and whiteboards and so on, which are very useful. But there's a lot of informal discussions and so on, which are very important. And that includes body language and informal reactions that you can't see, thing, things that you would pick up in a room or you know, under a tree with somebody that you don't do virtually. Um, we had a big challenge with variable bandwidth. We had some participants in Geneva who were fine, and we had some participants in remote areas of Papua, like Wamana, which have trouble with electricity, let alone bandwidth. And that, that'll be familiar to our Aboriginal colleagues and in Australia. So it was a challenge. Um, not everyone was familiar with the various platforms, um, voice over internet platforms, um, like the one we're using now. And we were working in 13 time zones, so that restricted when we could realistically um, operate, um, to be fair to everybody. Um, and so the approach we adopted, if you go one more time, please, Anita. Thank you. Um, we used document review and semi-structured interview methods. Um, we decided to use just two languages, um, English and Bahasa Indonesia. Normally, when we're working in Papua, we would also use Papuan languages. But because of the delays in that, we decided, and, and our Papuan colleagues agreed, that we'd use Bahasa Indonesia with them. Um, but I mean, no, normally when we conduct these evaluations, uh, we'd be working in four or five languages. Again, something that's quite familiar to many colleagues in, in Australia, at least. Um, but we agreed on two. We did conduct a deep dive, and the theme that our partners wanted to look at was sustainability, particularly around the private sector. Um, and we deliberately included time for feedback and reaction from participants because we weren't able to pick up those informal things. So we, want, we wanted to give people time to reflect and come back not immediately after a discussion, but later that day or the next day. And so a number of lessons, if we go to the next slide, please, Anita. Thank you, just click it once for the first one. Um, it really, we, these, these are things that we found from this experience. Um, having a very clear purpose and understanding of the needs. We, we want everybody involved in the remote evaluation to understand why we're doing the work and what we're going to do in the particular meeting or interview. So, so it's efficient. Thanks, Anita. Um, we had a very practical schedule of interviews, six one-hour interviews per day with about half an hour between interviews uh, to allow the evaluators to confer and also time for food and other breaks. Yeah, pe people need to go to the bathroom, they need to eat, they need to have a break. Next one, Anita, please. Um, we, we learned that you need human resources to schedule and manage the interview logistics, you know, setting up meetings in Zoom or Team or whatever platform you're using, um, making sure documents are available at least a day in advance, making sure the right people are coming. Um, and then in our case, we learned this on the fly, um, but language and protocols for each interview have to be agreed up front. And we're about to repeat this in August, and, and we've, we're going to send around protocols and um, language and so on for the interviews well in advance so that people are prepared. That will make things more efficient. Um, we use video at the beginning so that people could see each other, but then it was off because many people, myself included, in, in Yandi on Ramanjiri country, 
Um, the, the NBN, we have National Broadband Network, is, is very weak here. It's a satellite link, again, similar to many remote communities in Australia. Um, and we just don't have the bandwidth. So video off, mute microphones, as we're doing now, use the hand up function um, and, the, and the chat functions. And we, we manage the time very tightly. So as, as Cara is about to do and wave a finger at me, um, we, we kept things very tight so that um, it, it worked efficiently. And then at the end of all of that, we, as we do anyway, but it's normally face to face, but we had a very um, carefully facilitated feedback session for implementers and funders so that after Rob and I had done the data collation and analysis and reporting, there was time for clarification and reaction before the final report went in. So a fairly typical evaluative process, but just giving people a bit more um, time um, to, so that they could do, do that. So there's, there's a few bits and pieces in there that hopefully help people as they prepare for their own remote evaluation. So I'll hand back to you, Cara, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, and I'm going to send an advanced apology from John who has to um, leave uh, right on the dot of 3.30. So if you have any questions um, for him, you might like to send them through now. If he, uh, so he might have a chance to respond by the chat function briefly. But I don't want to cause a distraction from our final presenter. Um, Donna, if you wouldn't mind um, getting yourself ready, here's your slides. Um, and Donna's got a beautifully colourful um, <laughs> slide deck. Uh, and we have, uh, many of us have inadvertently uh, dressed to match. Um, <laughs> Want more colour in these remote uh, in these remote connections? So Donna, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Cara, and uh, hello everybody from uh, Ghana lands in South Australia, the beautiful Port Nalunga South, in the Onkapringa River mouth. Um, it's really great to have an opportunity to, I guess, share some of the emerging thinking and lessons that um, my team and colleagues have had as we've been struggling to undertake an end-term evaluation of what is actually an extraordinarily complex global multi-stakeholder partnership um, uh, called the PRIDE program. I'm actually working on this program with, uh, I, I myself am a international development evaluator and um, I'm working with an organisation called Edge Effect, which works with um, LGBTI communities, um, it's based out of Melbourne um, and particularly kind of looking at how do they include the community within development efforts and the program itself is actually delivered by an organisation called COC which is based in the Netherlands. So this is a partnership of um, an evaluation partnership of a very complex uh, program. So Sunita, if I could have the next slide please. Okay, this is just a, a really brief overview of the PRIDE program. The don't look at the theory of change too much. It's just showing kind of the complexity of, of the many, many pathways. This is an 18.5 million euro program that works over four years. It's part of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs Voices and Dissent program, which is a, a human rights program that works particularly with um, particularly vulnerable and marginalised groups worldwide. PRIDE works in 16 countries in five regions. It has 125 direct partners delivering over 300 different activities. And it's, um, it also has approximately 30 ad advocacy and technical partners that, that support the delivery of its global advocacy efforts. Um, I think one of the really important things when we're thinking about this program and to recognise about this program, it is a human rights program. It is about dialogue and dissent and it is working in these extremely narrow spaces. So over 80% of the countries in which it's working include countries such as Iraq, Ghana, Pakistan, um, Tanzania. So you can imagine that actually working with LGBTI communities in those sorts of spaces present significant risks to um, protection and security. 
There are five pillars for the program. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but there's also, as well as those kind of five pillars, there's also six cross-cutting issues that, that obviously work across those, all of those pillars and, and they're listed there in, in, um, in my presentation. I won't go, really don't want to go into exactly what it's doing because that will cut into our time, which is really around thinking about how have we addressed um, the, the shift in this, in this evaluation given um, the COVID context. Um, I guess the, the first thing to think about is that when we actually applied for this, for this evaluation and won the evaluation, COVID um, wasn't, wasn't a thing yet. Uh, we were actually working on this tender back in uh, December and January. Um, we were notified in late February about the work and um, at that point in time, COVID was sort of coming into play. We took quite a lot of time, I think, to work with the partner on recognising that our intent for field work would not happen. They were really holding on right up until, say, the end of March and even into April and the hope that field work would happen at some point in time. So one of our big issues was, was actually really trying to rethink and help the partner to rethink what would be possible. Um, obviously, you know, the first thing we think about when we've got to looking at a shift in context is changing the time frame. And that wasn't possible because this, this, um, this evaluation actually needed to be delivered within a set period of time, the money was going to run out, the donor decided that they still wanted the valuations to go ahead and wouldn't make the budget available um, beyond the funding period. Um, we, also, we sort of decided to look at, look at the scope of the valuation and, and we really worked with the partner to sort of focus on the purpose and, and the utility of, of what this, was, this evaluation was about. It was initially designed as a summative evaluation, but at the time we were designing the evaluation itself, the organisation COC was actually notified that they had an additional four years of funding for a new stage of a program. And so, in fact, this, this uh, evaluation became almost formative um, in some ways. So we agreed with them to focus on, on learning, focus on the effectiveness of the approaches that they've used over time, uh, exploration of risks and, and also as a result of that, we decided to, to maintain a focus on using really highly participatory outcome mapping and outcome harvesting processes. The, the, the graphic on the bottom is really just to show how we kind of looked at our stakeholder analysis with also defining the utility and the scope of the evaluation. So we really focused on that red and yellow area, which was where did this program have the greatest influence and control over their activities? So we really are focusing on the key actors uh, within the, the global LGBTI community and, and the methods that the program used to engage with them and then the methods that they used to engage with their communities downstream. We're not so much looking at, at impacts, et cetera, um, which I think we would have um, if we were doing the field work in COVID. Next slide, please, Sunita. Okay, um, so the plan is on the left. <laughs> it was pretty straightforward. Um, and I'm just gonna talk through some of the changes that we made. Um, we decided to go to um, a user process where we continued to use um, outcome mapping and outcome harvesting as our key, as our key process. Um, but we actually decided that instead of doing what was five deep dives within the field, we moved to doing nine remotely delivered case studies. And I'll talk a little bit about what those case studies later. What that means was our team of two evaluators, back office support, a bit of extra support for, for quality assurance, ended up with, with two lead evaluators, um, an evaluation director and a, and a lead researcher, eight local and international researchers, and also a data analyst. Um, we, we brought in, we added a, a fairly significant component to the program around data mapping um, to really try and help us to understand what was happening in that evaluation. 
we decided to move towards doing uh, summary country reports. We ended up with a survey um, and we brought a partnership health process into, into the evaluation process as well. And that was new because we um, received that or, or the partner knew that they'd actually received that additional funding. So they really felt the need to explore how the partnership worked. Something that was really significant for us, it was a significant shift in the way that the resources were used. So where we had originally 30% of our funds to fill costs, we still ended up using the entire budget, but only 5% of funds went to fill costs. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So that's sort of what the evaluation looked like. Uh, next slide, please, Sunita. Um, okay, so these are just a couple of, of the sort of real challenges that, that we found as, as we've sort of planned out this evaluation and um, and are implementing this evaluation. The first one is just dealing with, you know, with that co complexity that, that's shown within that theory of change and, and within the different cross-cutting issues um, within the program. We're really showing a very diverse movement, a diverse set of activities of pillars. Um, so it's been a challenge for us as sort of, for myself as the evaluation director and, and for, my colleague Claire, who's the, the, the lead researcher in terms of thinking, how do we bring these eight different researchers together into one mechanism so that actually our, our met, you know, we can get that met analysis and actually um, help with our high level assessments of, of effectiveness and, and efficiency and, and so forth. We ended up running our concurrent, we ended up running the case studies concurrently over a set period of time. At the same time, we ran a survey and at the same time, we managed a whole series of high level key informant interviews so that as we were meeting really regularly with the research teams, we've actually been able to bring data in from those different, from those different pieces of work. Um, so that's been, hot, that's been a real, real challenge for us. Um, we, we also engaged, we also engaged a data analyst and, and, and they spent time accessing into the COC database and, and, and was able to very heavily mine data, come up with clear um, descriptions of activities and maps of activities and resource spends and, and analytics that actually helped to define those case studies. Um, we met regularly with the researchers, um, and really needed to take time to create a safe environment for them. Um, the, the second key issue for us that, that comes into this evaluation is, is the security and protection risks uh, associated with, with working um, with LGTBI communities in, in, in very narrow spaces. Um, some of the ways that we kind of managed that was was we, we look to the actors for solutions. We recognise that the people who, who are, you know, the brave people who are doing this work in very narrow spaces um, actually are, are used to working in those spaces and have workarounds and solutions. So that was something that was really useful for us. We use consent, obviously, as, as a first principle, but also op, op, opting out of all lines of inquiry if, if um, you know, if different actors didn't feel that they were, you know, able, confident to to be able to respond, I found that working identifying researchers from the community itself, from the LGBTI community, was really really important. And in some cases, actually using local researchers who who actually were aware of the work that was being done, understood the communities themselves, the challenges that those communities were experiencing was actually really, really fundamental. Um, yeah, that was, that was a really key piece of, of, um, of work and it helped to, to build trust and also to build, build relationships. We have very, very clear security protocols, you know, headphone use, uh, video opt, opt in, opt out, uh, informant driven times and locations, uh, informants determining what sort of media they want to um, use. Um, we are 
we managed to negotiate access to actually use the partner server. So our information is actually provided on their server because they were able to provide a higher level of internet security than we were. Um, and our data analyst is actually also a data security expert. So we were actually really able to draw heavily on her. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so other challenges that, that we have is verification does still remind, still remain uh, a challenge as we're as we're moving through things. In particular, getting access to to kind of verification of, of secondary and tertiary sort of evidence, particularly around allies. So not necessarily actors in the movement who are part of the activities, but the government service providers that they're connecting with, the police, the authorities and so forth. So that's something that, that actually we, we're just kind of trying to, to work around at the moment. Um, we have very clearly accepted agreed limitations with, with um, our partner and we maintain um, really clear lines of communication around that. Um, the other, other area obviously is just the location and the relationship. So, you know, we're working in, we've got researchers in about eight different countries. I'm the evaluation director, I'm based in South Australia. The lead researcher is based in Canada and the, the partner is based in the Netherlands. So just that in itself to get all of us actually into a room means that somebody's up at one o'clock in the morning and somebody else is up at six o'clock in the morning. So those sorts of things have been real challenges. So we rotate our meetings. Um, and I've found that's been really great because it's actually keeping everybody quite well informed. Um, we also felt that we needed a lot of time to focus on process, um, not just with the client, but also within the team and actually build a high degree of trust so that we could actually get the contestability that we wanted for the robustness of, of the evaluation process. I'm conscious of time, so I'll just run, run through a couple of last points. So for me, the, these are the sorts of things that I think were, were just the most valuable in terms of the approach um, that we've been taking. We've used a partnering approach. We've built engagement in internal contestability with the partner themselves. So we've actually really, really asked them to, to develop their internal narrative um, they co-created the analytical framework, which was a definition that says, this is what we think success for this program would look like. We've con consistently engaged them sort of in outcome harvesting type sessions um, so that we're working through with them, you know, why is this change created? What, how do you think, what do you think are the pathways, et cetera? So that's taken a lot of time and a lot of really um, important partnership and trust building. Um, mining the data has been absolutely, the role of the data analyst has been very, very fundamental to actually, to getting the case studies off the ground, to be able to understand uh, where the stories are within a program of this size. So, so bringing that person in right up to give us that that really strong picture of the program was, was absolutely critical. And we've now included the data analyst into the lead evaluators team. So she sits with the, myself and with, with the research, um, the lead researcher to, to make sure that we're actually able to cross verify information and so forth. Case studies have been fantastic. They've enabled us um, to really dig quite deep down into, into the theory of change, into understanding how change happens, and to articulate that really well within, within, within the report itself. Um, so I'm actually really happy, and, and I would say arguably, I think we've got a better product than we would have by actually running traditional in-field sessions um, in country. Um, again, I have said before, working with local and international researchers, from the community itself was absolutely fundamental um, in terms of having people, informants and actors being comfortable to speak, um, but also uh, 
them being able to kind of listen and really understanding the, the, the really complex dynamics of, of what's happened in each of those areas. Uh, from my perspective and, and in uh, full disclosure, I'm also a partnership broker and we brought a partnership health check process into this and, and that has been really interesting because through that process, what we've actually been able to identify was that there's a whole sphere of work within this evaluation, which is around the way the donor and the, the funded organisation, the COC, have actually worked on political, interval, inter, uh, on political levels with embassies in countries, with the, with the UN, et cetera, to actually raise, um, raise critical human rights issues around the LGBTI community. Um, so that has been something that's been very valuable. And finally, Sunita, one more, please. Um, funding flexibility was absolutely fundamental. We have used all of the budget, but we've had to, we've really had to invest in researchers. We've had to invest more time in, in, um, in processes and so forth. Um, you know, in the end, I guess, excuse me, my dog's just popped up. <laughs> Remote evaluation in the end is actually not cheap. Um, so that, that was a key issue. Um, and we also had to take care around not sort of setting up perverse incentives around um, people's participation in, in the process. Um, and then I'm just gonna talk quickly to the last one, the focus on internal team relationships and, and agility, that was, for us building that, that really strong rapport, not just with the client, but also with, within the research team has been so important in terms of addressing contestability um, and so forth, making sure that, that different researchers can, can connect with each other and, and talk about where the intersectionality between their different um, pieces of research are falling. Um, but that was also tested just recently where the, where the lead researchers, uh, grandparent died and, and they needed to leave the process for a few weeks. And we were actually able to have other researchers come in and actually lead research meetings and so forth. So I felt that in a crisis, what, what that taught us was maintaining those strong, you know, relationships were really, really important to deal with the stresses that are going to continue to come through working in a context like this. Um, so there we go. Thank you, Donna. You had me lulled in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just sent a chat out to everyone just to say we know, so the session is for an hour and a half, but we know that a lot of you can only stay for an hour. So I'm gonna give those of you who need to exit stage left a few moments to do so. Um, but also wanted to now um, open the floor to questions and also extend the apologies from John again that he hasn't been able to stay for the question session. Um, while you're, um, while people are thinking about um, questions and, and uh, feel free to add anything into the chat, um, I, it's interesting listening to all three of you actually, and I think actually Donna, you summed it up nicely at the end, I was thinking, what's maybe the most significant change to my my own practice that I've had to make in this, um, you know, in the last couple of months? And the points that everyone's made around the importance of communication and relationships and how we've needed to change the ways that we're either establishing or maintaining those connections and those relationships. Um, and you know, and we're and and the mental burden that that puts on us sometimes to know that we need to do that, but also getting up to speed with new tools to try and do that. Um, it, but it's it still boils down to much this you know similar themes that we already know, which is around relationships are really key. It's just how we do that is is different. Okay, we've got questions flowing through now. Um, Let's have a quick look. 
Okay, Mary's got a question for you, Donna. You mentioned that remote work is expensive. Can you elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I would. <laughs> Um, sure. Look, I guess that when we when we started this evaluation, when when we when the evaluation was designed, thirty percent of the budget was for field work, um, and and that that included sort of you know uh, certain members of the teams to engage local researchers to work in the field, the travel costs, all of that type of thing. And while we're now not doing any travel, what we have had to do is actually really uh, invest in the quality of the researchers that we're getting and also the supervision of those researchers. And so that's something that, that has actually has, has costed just simply in terms of, of time. But we've now gone from a team of, of two or two, two and a bit um, with a couple of days of translators and, and local context advisors in those, those initially planned five field visits to actually now having you know, nine, nine researchers in place for a period of about four weeks to do what a really, really detailed analytic. So, so that for us has been a really big investment. And then the second thing was, I just can't stress enough how valuable bringing the data analyst has been um, into the process. And, and um, that has taken in a program of this size, she's had 20 days of, of work looking at the data anal analytics um, because, you know, we are talking about 125 partners plus, you know, additional partners. So, and, and she's now putting together sort of country synthesis reports of everything that has happened because those reports have been what's actually helped us to determine where the case studies are and where to use the examples out of the different countries um, to, to put into those, those case studies. The case studies being thematic, country focused, um, et cetera. So I think that's where a lot of the cost is, has actually gone. Yeah. yeah Dwee, and I was wondering if you might like to reflect um, on, from your point of view, because you've, you've actually got a really interesting perspective. And as you, you said in one of our early open spaces, way back in the thick of lockdown, that you've, um, you guys have been having to work remotely as part of your business as usual anyway. And so i um, curious just to know how you, you know, do you feel that there is an added cost or that that cost is spread in different ways when you're doing this as your normal way of working? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I suppose costs-wise is the time that you spend um, in building capacity of uh, communities to participate and, and to communicate um, it's, 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 it's that time spent you got to prepare a lot more which which um, I think Donna spoke a fair bit about and um, uh, was it John John yeah mm -hmm. you just um, uh, there's a lot more time consuming um, but also um, interestingly what I've seen coming out of the two both present the two presentation is that we adapt and created innovative ways to still do our work um, and that's that's what even myself just looking at the to Donna's and John's presentation, I've learned a lot, picked up a lot about mm. that. I think um, the key to to success is not only building capacity, but I think it's maintaining those relationships and trust with the stakeholders that you're working with. I think that's an important element of yeah. Yeah. all of our work. I think that's the key. You're not going to succeed. Um, the other thing is uh, don't be frightened to try new things uh, and come up with it, different ways of doing stuff. Um, but just just with my current work at the moment, I'm, I'm not a evaluator in any sense. I'm a community development practitioner. But 
um, evaluation is, is embedded in our work, but you've got to come up with different ways to how you engage and gather the information. It's still able to work with the communities or stakeholders to get the outcomes that you want to achieve. Mm. Jade has asked a classic uh, lessons learned question around um, now based on your experience, what would you do differently? Um, and reflecting on, you know, particularly at the using of online modes and things. Donna, I'll ask you to um, start and then uh, Doya, maybe you want to just reflect on some of the things that you might have experimented on recently. But Donna, you first. What would you do differently if you had the time again? Uh, in designing, I, I think um, it. I think for me, a lot of my reflection is now as I'm looking at designing new pieces of work moving forwards. Is really questioning my role, and you know, do I need to be that person that's in the field all the time, and and really coming to really coming to terms with my utility? I think that that for me is something that's just really really important. The experience, the talent that the Edge Effect team has been able to get in terms of the researchers that we've used, both international and, and local researchers, has just been absolutely extraordinary. I mean, we've got amazing sort of human rights lawyers from Egypt and, and you know, just, just and extraordinary actors, you know, people who have been exiled from their countries and worked in this movement for 20 years. Um, I have just working with them has been incredibly rich for me and and I think for the for the whole team so I think we're really kind of thinking through what are the skills we need who can do these pieces of research and how can I support them use my skills and my 30 years of practice to actually support them around what is good evaluative research and how to work with people on on telling telling their stories so you know that that for me is is a really really key takeaway and um and i think you know it's something with, which i usually do in my anyway but is really working on these sort of outcome really using on harvesting really working with program logic really trying to help beneficiaries like articulate the change that's happening from them for them so that those would be the things for me that I want to take forward. So would it be fair to say, I'm just looking at Ken's question around, you know, what changes as a result of COVID-19 you think you're most likely to maintain. It sounds like, Donny, you're, you're suggesting that maybe really trying to encourage and force in, in a strengths-based way, doing it differently in future that, so that you're leveraging that, that strength. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's that real focus on process. It's really forced. You know, I think you, we all like to say we focus on process when we go and do consultations and stuff like that. But as John indicated, when you're spending, you know, three weeks in the back of a land cruiser doing 12 hours a day, driving between village to village to village, you know, when you walk into those meetings and you sit out there under the trees, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you, you know, you're just so tired that the process goes out the window and you're just kind of trying to get through your data collection process. Yeah. We yeah. all know that that's, that can happen to us. So it has been beautiful to just sort of sit back and really think about, think what, what John said about what is it that we really want to, we really want to know. Yeah. And, and I think what, you know, what I heard from Doyen about the, the, you know, the yarning tool and stuff like that is really thinking about we're here to listen and how are the different ways that we can listen? So, yeah. Cool. So, Doyen, on that, and that, that particularly, you know, because that process piece is something that all three of you have really stressed and getting that process bit right. Um, have you been experimenting with any new tools recently? And what would you, what would you keep and what would you chuck? <laughs> well, I suppose is, I, I, I suppose, um, using a tool that you can use both online as well as face to face. Mm. I think that's the key thing. If you're able to have a tool in your toolbox, like the seed the tree is something that we can, I can actually pin it up behind me and do a evaluation process using the seed the tree or 
done it before, um, but also you'd be able to take it into the field and lay it down in front of people and do it that way. It's something that you can use both. I think the key thing is finding the tool that you can use um, both online or you can use in the field face to face. And I think that's a key learning. That's a really uh, interesting point. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Nolan's got a question about reporting findings. Um, I'm interested in how we report on evaluations and implement findings. Does this change during COVID? It also seems to be difficult in remote evaluations. Would either of you care to start <laughs> or comment? Um, would you like to repeat that question again? So Nolan is wondering, um, when it comes to reporting and implementing um, findings from an evaluation, does that change in a COVID environment? Does the reporting and the implementation of findings change? And he was noting that he seems it, it seems to be more difficult in remote evaluations. How do you actually take the learnings from this remote piece of work and implement it? I think possibly it's sometimes because people might be thinking of this as some exceptional event and then we're going to go back to BAU. So maybe there's the, the transferability of, of findings may not be always immediately apparent. Yeah. Um, and Nolan, if you want to clarify further, if I've made a meal of it, please do so. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Uh, no, I think you, you got it pretty yeah. much. Uh, it's just we do struggle with reporting back. Um, I mean, the way we've done it is we've had workshops and things like that. But in this environment, it's a bit difficult to do that and to get feedback um, on, on the learnings back to stakeholders, and then really implementing those findings and seeing, you know, how to make, uh, how, how do we uh, improve what we're doing. Um, you know, we're pretty good at doing the evaluation bit. Uh, but I felt in this environment, it sort of makes for, for my job, for example, makes it like a hundred times harder to get around to doing this, to get out there and um, come up with strategies to uh, change how we're working, to improve how we're doing things. Donna, do you have any, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I do. Okay, I'm just checking that I was, I was on, on mute. Um, I guess that it's, I guess that in, in my, in, in the field in which I work, we have to recognise that we're actually, you know, even implementing partners are often remote partners. And, and I think, you know, it's acknowledging that and really making, making time to, you know, obviously to be able to think about how you report back is, is something that's really, really important. You know, I think just because we're working remotely doesn't mean we can't run workshops. We might not be able to run one day workshops, but we might be able to run a, a series of a session a week for four weeks to talk about different parts of, of the evaluation. So that, and that's sort of what we're trying to do with COC at the moment, really engage them as we're coming up with our meta-analysis in actually talking through results and, and talking around findings. So I think that taking some more of those sort of action, you know, action um, evaluation sorts of processes or developmental processes into your evaluation um, if you can is is good if that's not going to um, create an issue around independence or objectivity etc um, which you know I always think that those things can be managed um, and I think this the other thing is planning for really trying to think about what's your communication strategy that's you know that's one of those downward accountability things that we as evaluators always need to think about is you know, is this just going to go and sit on somebody's desk in, in Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade? Or is it actually going to go back to the people implementing the program and, and, and downstream? So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of upon us to think about how do you communicate beyond, beyond the delivery of the report. Um, and I think just going back to the question about just reporting, is, is also just being, we had to be very, very clear, or we were, be, did become very clear with the COC um, evaluation for the Pride evaluation, what we, what we couldn't do and, and what we could do. And we made that explicit 
within the evaluation plan and as we're reporting out, we're reporting exceptions consistently. So I do know that uh, as we're reporting out, you know, there, there are a lot more sort of, you know, footnotes at the bottom to say, well, we've actually been able to verify that with X, but we can't actually get a secondary verification, right? So, you know, we're having to do a lot more of, of that, but I think that's just, I think that's going to be our reality um, for, for a long period of time, certainly in the international development space, because, you know, we, we st you know, we're in this first wave globally and, and this is going to be the reality for a very long time for many of those countries in which we're working. So I think this is our new normal. Um, there's a couple of other questions that have come through, but Doyen, I wanted to ask one question that I'm sure others will have been thinking about. I was struck by uh, you, your comments again about relationships and time, um, but and then getting people up to speed with using some of the Zoom and those sorts of things. How did how did you find the person in that community in the first instance to provide that support to get them online? Or were you doing it over the phone? I'll just initially start off. You start off slowly and I suppose just starting off slowly with the community and find someone who's able to access the IT. Some of, some of the relationships that we, we have pre-existing relationships in the community, so that made it quite easy. Mm. We have come across one project uh, community of, that we work with where we just started off brand new and we didn't have any existing relationship, but it was just a matter of talking and, and communicating, building that trust over the phone, and then slowly working towards that online platform, such as Zoom or Teams or Skype, what everyone yeah. uses. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Um, so you develop... have to keep asking <laughs> and asking yeah. and asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just keep on working because if the community, if people are keen and are prepared, because we don't, if people are keen to move forward, then they'll, then they'll communicate and participate and it makes it a lot easier as opposed to trying to force someone to do something. Yeah. Donna, uh, Marie's asking you a, a curly question around her CTs. I don't know if you've seen us in the chat. In a post-COVID-19 environment, how would you measure impact in a non-RCT methodology? Do you think that in general, remote m and &E influences the results of what works, success, impact? How do we address the attribution gap? And I'll just get you off mute. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, yeah, Marie, thanks for that question. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, look, I think I can, I can answer that question in relation to this piece of work very specifically. And no, we're not working with, with randomised control methods and, and so forth. What, what we are working with in the PRIDE program in, in particular is about the particular lived experience of a very defined group of individuals. And so we have been able to do the impact analysis and the attribution analysis through actually very, very detailed storytelling of amongst those individuals and, but, but also sort of overlapping that the sort of outcome harvesting process as well, where we're actually really being able to sort of look at what are the outcomes that, that the program has achieved, which we're kind of looking at through our analytics and through our case studies, and then actually really trying to map back, back you know, how has that change happened? What was the role of specific interventions of the program or different actors? Or what was the implication of a particular context shift um, to, to those individuals' lives? So we're really looking at this, this work um, for this program very much at that sort of largely at that individual level. Um, and then there's another, there's actually another piece of research at the moment which is looking at how does that then go up to a to the community level, meaning that LGBTI or you know diverse sexual orientation, uh, gender identity uh, community within um, 
within a particular context. So we're sort of looking at this movement building concept as well. Um, so I might need to come back to you in a couple of weeks once we've looked at that one in a bit more detail. Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge, Ken, Ken, I think that I've, um, we've addressed your question, but if you've got any, any other follow-ups, feel free to pop them in the chat in the last, in the last five minutes. Um, I, oh, good, Fab. Um, I, just a quick follow-up question, Donna. You mentioned the use of outcomes um, harvesting as one of your tools, and I forget actually from your slide if that had been part of your original plan it's something that I've seen a few people you seeming to use more in this in this kind of context, and I'm interested in you commenting on how useful you might have found it in a remote um, setting. Yeah, so so I um, it's it's a it's a really great question, Cara, and and this was the big the the big challenge for us right at the very beginning was the whole the whole evaluation was actually to be planned around an outcome harvesting process. So it was very much around the storytelling of the partners and, and so forth. And, and when the, when we started to plan this out, we decided we couldn't do the field trip. COC was most concerned that we wouldn't actually be able to do outcome harvesting at all. And I, Basically, I think that what we've sort of done was we've done training with the researchers to help them to use the sorts of questioning and the sorts of processes that you go through in a harvesting process with individuals and with small groups of individuals as well. So, you know, while we're really used to outcome harvesting as being, you know, that, that cacophony of noise and people mapping things out and, and contesting things, you can still use those those forms of inquiry with individuals to get there. So for me, I think it's always about the quality of the inquiry and the journey that you take people on through an evaluation that's the most important thing. Um, and so that comes back to that building a relationship, having trust, um, you know, something I just want to add to that. If you think about trying to have, for example, a conversation with an LGBTI activist in somewhere like Egypt that, you know, is an extraordinary narrow space. The ability to actually use a local researcher who they may have a, a relationship with already and help that researcher to be able to walk them through that process is actually really quite powerful. And it's something that I couldn't have done, even though, you know, I'm used to using those methods, but I would never have got that, that the trust mm. from, those, from those people. So I think you can, you know, it's about your quality of inquiry. Yeah. Mm. We've got a, only a couple of minutes to go. So I'm going to wrap up the questions and answers, but I just want to reflect back some of the things that I've taken away from this. And I think what this recent experience has uh, taught me in listening to your, um, to your presentations as well as, you know, we all know that relationships are important, but this has really highlighted it for us in different ways. And we know about trust and the comments about, you know, being really careful and purposeful in the process and taking time to plan. Um, I've, you know, these aren't new things, but I feel like they've, um, the COVID-19 environment has really sharpened our thinking around it, this because we've, not being able to take certain things for granted. Um, and I'm, despite my frustration of having to plan my, my sort of sense-making sessions more carefully, I know that it's actually, it's a useful and it adds value. Um, and so for me, that's been, it's reassuring uh, to listen to, to, your, um, to your feedback. Um, I want to thank the, our three presenters again, Doyen, Donna and John, who's departed. I want to thank our um, New Zealand um, AES committee, our partners in South Australia and in Western Australia. It's a complete delight that this, this kind of joined up um, approach probably wouldn't have happened for another few years if COVID-19 hadn't happened as AES. So, you know, many silver linings, right? So I'm going to close with a karakia. And, uh, and farewell you all uh, on a very good rest of your day. Kia ora te marino, 
ki whakapapa ponamu te moana. Hei hurahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i e tātou katoa, hui e tahiki e. Kia ora everybody, have a fantastic rest of your afternoon and um, hope to see you all again online <laughs> soon.